Good morning. Even if it's lunchtime, it's still the morning in many civilized places. <coughs> so I think it's a very good idea to come to this session because everything is there. Everything is there. It will cover the whole topic of alveolar heart disease. We're going to have a fantastic review. No risk. The speaker is ready. Then we'll go, we'll be stepping into the future in the different domains. And we'll step into the future of the future, that is to say, combined procedure. What a fantastic menu. So let's start with Marty, Leon, who is going to tell us about what, where are we with structural intervention today. Well, Alec, thank you very much. This is an all-star cast at the panel, so it's a pleasure to be part of this. Um, and this is a little bit of an eclectic overview presentation, so I will not bore you with too much data. And then I think you'll hear a lot of practical clinical examples of some of the new therapies that are currently and in the future will be available for our patients. So first, let me begin with some background. And I'll begin by saying that if you can think, this is TCT 2001. Um, this is literally, this was the, the day before 9-11. And I was giving a lecture in the main arena, and I was thinking of where interventional therapies are going, and I showed this slide, and for the first time I mentioned the term structural heart disease. Um, and we've used that term ever since. We didn't quite know what that meant, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. But the term seems to have stuck around as being something that people have enjoyed to represent the particular kind of interventional work that we are currently doing. If we scroll forward now 15 years, you see these are the worldwide cardiology market predictions and trends. You can see that in 2010, that the world is dominated by PCI in the interventional cardiovascular space. If you go up to 2020, you see that it is now bifurcated, where half the dollars are for vascular therapy and half are for structural therapy. And it's remarkable to see how fast this particular genre within interventional cardiology has grown. So now, if you are a modern center in PCI, you think of three different kinds of interventions. Coronary vascular, then you think of endovascular, applying to vascular disease outside of the heart, and you think of structural heart disease. And that really is what at least my definition is of modern PCI. It's not coronary intervention, it's percutaneous cardiovascular intervention, and that includes all of these disciplines. Now, to be successful with any new therapy and intervention, you have to really fulfill certain criteria. The first is you have to be treating diseases which are compelling and don't have adequate or optimal therapies, what some people call the clinical need or the clinical imperatives. Second, you have to have available new technologies, in this case, less invasive, percutaneous, catheter-based technologies, and then, to be honest, you have to validate it. And you have to validate it with good clinical research and evidence-based medicine. That has been one of the strengths of this space, but also some of the weaknesses in terms of the data gaps, because we're still in a state of rapid um, transition and rapid evolution. In the earlier days of PCI, in the 80s, even the 90s, we really focused on devices and many people thought of themselves as proceduralists. I think this has to change in structural heart disease. We have to be thinking more about therapies and going back to the time when we were actually clinicians. Because the reality is, for any given patient, there may be medical therapy that's more appropriate or is concomitant to device therapy. There may be surgical techniques that would be preferable at some point in time. So it's the natural history of the disease and the appreciation of what therapies are best at any point in time, which makes you a structural clinician, which is what we all aspire to be. So some definitions and scope. So. This term is a wastebasket. It's meant to include all non-vascular procedures which utilize catheter-based technologies. So if we look at our wastebasket, on one side, we have largely the valve therapies, BAV, percutaneous mitral commiserotomy, 
Taver, Mitraclip, and the new mitral and tricuspid therapies, and PVL closure. That's one side of the structural coin. On the other side are non-valve structural diseases, adult congenital diseases, and most recently, and certainly in the United States, left atrial appendage, and now with the new data, PFO closure, is increasing dramatically. And then in the future, I want to just mention that heart failure therapies could be extremely important in this genre as well. So this is the totality of structural heart disease. Importantly, this really emphasizes the confluence of two fully evolved concepts. One is non-vascular image-guided therapies, specifically and largely ECHO and MSCT. And second, the concept of the multidisciplinary heart team strategy with careful pre-procedural planning. This is not what we used to do so much or do even now with coronary intervention. Yeah. You truly have to be imaging experts. You have to spend time planning the procedures. This, requ this requires a significant adjustment in the training of the interventional operators and also the treatment milieus. You, have to, you don't need necessarily a hybrid cath lab OR, but you do need to have even a cath lab that has certain equipment and certain space to accommodate the needs of the procedures. So I was asked to say a word about epidemiology. You've all seen this, so I'm not going to go over it again, but I will tell you that over the age of 75, now worldwide, more than 10% of people have moderate or severe valvular heart disease. It is a highly prevalent disease. If we just look at the TAVR expected growth, by 2025, about 300,000 procedures. U.S. alone in the next 12 months, 45,000 procedures. This year worldwide, over 100,000 procedures. The growth has been phenomenal. Even though it's phenomenal, these are the historical and current demographics of surgical aortic valve replacement. Now we add TAVR, very nice, treating older patients. But these are the patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. And you'll see that the vast majority are still underdiagnosed and undertreated. So in the future, awareness of the problem needs to be emphasized. We need to develop some creative ways to identify these patients and get them into therapy. Same problem with mitral regurgitation. U.S. alone, disease prevalence, striking, 4.6 million, divided equally between primary and secondary MR. Importantly, almost 2 million over the age of 75 years old, so an elderly population, and frankly, not much surgery being done. In the U.S., annually, about 55,000 cases, so a very large and growing gap between definitive therapy of the MR and severe symptomatic patients. And lastly, tricuspid disease, even worse. You can see here, either in Europe or the US, extraordinary prevalence numbers and incidence numbers, you can see, which is annual cases or new cases per year, but a very small number of surgical cases in the range of 10 to 13,000. So clearly there's a large gap between treatment and disease. I'll just mention that, again, left atrial appendage closure is part of this space and is growing rapidly. About a um, 35 to 50 percent compound annual growth rate in the United States alone. And we're going to see the same thing with PFO closure. This is just an interesting historical reflection on the RESPECT trial. Now with new data, there is no question that this procedure is going to be done more frequently as well. This is part of the structural domain. And as I mentioned, heart failure may be the next big breakthrough. And I've listed the many different ways to manage patients with heart failure using devices, including at the high end, mechanical circulatory support, but also sensors, LV remodeling devices, microvads, interatrial shunts, and a variety of other things. So we use the Impella CP not infrequently and in creative ways now, and there are other catheter-based circulatory support devices. Many heart failure programs now routinely are using implantable sensors for heart failure. And here are two interatrial shunt devices, one the Corvia shown here, which has already had a feasibility sham randomized trial entering pivotal US trials in the United States. And the V-Wave device, 
some different features, but also being studied now as well, with two manuscripts in the Lancet already with these two different devices. At Columbia, we did about 4,100 interventions in 2016. And you can see here the, the relative proportions. And yes, still dominated by coronary, but 22% were structural interventions. And among those 850 interventions, very much dominated by aortic interventions, and we have a large adult congenital program, but the mitral tricuspid is growing, and this year it's doubled compared to the year before. Left atrial appendage has tripled, so you'll see these procedures increase very rapidly in your environment. So I'm gonna conclude by telling you just the four components of structural heart intervention today. One is you can't do this without a multidisciplinary heart team and people with dedicated expertise. You have to have structured clinics and patient care conferences. These physicians have to be essentially full-time who are committed to this program, including anesthesia and imaging. You need good consultants and you need good cooperation from nursing and hospital administrators to manage logistics and finances. This is, our, uh, this is now many years ago, but our 500th Taver at Columbia, and you see Matt Williams, a surgeon who I trained um, and is a wonderful structural interventionalist and cardiac surgeon, and Sushil Kadali, who's an expert in cardiac imaging and an interventionalist. Those are the skills you need. The multimodality imaging cannot be emphasized enough. It's necessary for diagnosis, planning, guidance, and long-term follow-up, and specifically 2D, 3D, um, T and, and TEE and advanced CTA techniques as well. Um, CMR is now becoming interesting and co-registration also I think will be part of the future. Training is essential. You have to have dedicated training programs and tutorials to learn things like the correct transeptal puncture, vascular access and management. So we have structural fellowships, we have many programs, there are many centers that are being developed, and we've introduced the concept of interventional echocardiography, echocardiographers who are in the lab wearing lead, helping to guide the procedures, and commitment to an environment that would allow you to do these procedures. And this is just an example of a hybrid cath lab OR that we use at Columbia. And finally, clinical research at this stage is really embedded in what we do. We have to be collecting data. So we have a large infrastructure, and I think anyone who does this has to commit to doing clinical research and to execute it with proficiency. And there are many ways to do this, and there are gonna be many trials in the future that we'll discuss. So just like what we've done in the aortic space with TAVR as shown here, 23 randomized controlled trials in the past and in the future. We're seeing that now in the other new spaces within structural heart disease, phase one and phase two studies, and now evolving into phase three and phase four trials. So to conclude, this structural heart disease where the name was almost uh, um, a whim, it really had no meaning in the beginning, I think really has evolved over the past 15 years into a new dynamic and clinically important subspecialty. It sparked a lot of excitement and growth in the modern era of PCI. As I've said, the requirements include a dedicated multidisciplinary heart team, specialized imaging expertise, continuous training exercises. At this stage, everyone is learning and from each other. Specific cath lab and OR capabilities and a commitment to clinical research. I think TAVR has already achieved significant success and is what some people call the poster child of structural heart disease. Soon to follow will certainly be these new techniques that you're seeing at this meeting in mitral and tricuspid disease, as well as left atrial appendage and PFO closure. An interesting recent development has been the realization that combination therapies are frequently required to manage complex structural heart disease scenarios. You'll hear about these during this um, session because I think it's like the surgeon. You have to really customize your thinking. And finally, I do believe that an important future vision is to explore and conquer the impact of interventional device therapy in patients with various heart failure syndromes. So we'll be exploring some of this at TCT next month. And there now is even a journal called Structural Heart, the journal of the heart team 
um, where I believe that we'll begin to continue to see some of the evolution in this very interesting and important new field. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marty. This was a, a great uh, beginning of the session. I will go without uh, discussion already to the second speaker, which is uh, Axel Linke, which has, I would say, a pretty difficult task. How will Tavi technologies evolve over the next five to 10 years? I thought we were already perfect, so what is missing? <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> um, I think you're all aware of the fact that since the first uh, porcine implant occurred in uh, 1989, Tavra has really become a success story, and the same is uh, true for interventions on the uh, pulmonary valve. Um, just a few data on the uh, SDS registry, as you can see here, then, then Tavra number had grown about sixfold from 2012 to 2016, whereas the number of conventional valve surgeries has remained stable in the U.S., a similar trends were observed um, in Europe, well, where the tri trial started a little earlier, clinical adoption occurred a little earlier, but uh, the U.S. and Northern America is going uh, to follow. And in 2018, about more than 90,000 procedures are expected. <clears throat> uh, you have already seen a uh, slide which uh, uh, I have taken from uh, Dr. Young's talk from TVT, and the market is to grow any further based on the, on the numbers that T uh, just um, illustrated. However, as of today, the majority of the patients that we are treating with TOVR is still in the high risk and intermediate risk cohort, but the majority is low risk and they have not been uh, addressed in the, in the studies as well and also not in clinical uh, daily practice. <coughs> um, the evidence is coming from a lot of, of randomized uh, trials that involves all kinds of, of different products from all of the different um, uh, companies, and those solid data really generate the basis for our clinical decision making uh, today. However, um, uh, the future um, or the developments in the future have to be addressed. Uh, systems are still not perfect. We deal with power valve leaks with conduction abnormalities. And um, Abbott has um, a strong investment into the future uh, to adapt the technology to the requirements of the, uh, uh, of the clinicians and of the market. This is the next generation of the, of the Abbott Portico valve um, that has a self-expandable nitinol structure with uh, some kind of a bigger cell type. Uh, there will be cover at the base <clears throat> to seal off power valvular leaks uh, more efficiently. And as you know from the clinical data already, this is a valve that comes with a very low uh, pacemaker rate that is, was beyond 10%, uh, below 10% in the first clinical study. Uh, this is the new delivery sheets with the uh, new delivery system with the integrated cheese that enables treatment in patients with uh, very small thermals. There's a trial ongoing to assess the efficacy and safety of a, a direct aortic delivery or a subclavian um, excess. However, also the other companies work on future products. Um, this is the example of the uh, next generation of the Lotus valve, the so-called Lotus Edge. Uh, the Lotus consists of a single nitinol uh, wire that is um, actively uh, put in place and the valve is locked afterwards. You're also seeing the sealing technology at the base of this valve to um, uh, address power valvular leaks. An issue that had been seen with the previous generations was a higher pacemaker rate, but uh, the company is uh, very optimistic that this is resolved with the Lotus um, Edge system. And as you can see here, this is the valve, the only valve probably that can be fully deployed and resheathed. So it in really enables an implantation quality that is uh, close to what you would expect from a surgical intervention. Also, um, Edwards is working on the next generation of the Sapien called Sapien Ultra. Uh, the profile of this um, valve and the delivery system will be even smaller with all uh, valve sizes fitting through in 14 uh, French delivery sheaths. <coughs> it will be um, a redesigned uh, distal end and uh, then <clears throat> the next generation of the, of the uh, Sapien Ultra system, uh, will the, the valve will be crimped on the balloon itself, so there is no loading necessary inside the body. An alternative system uh, is uh, Santerra that is self-expandable. <clears throat> it comes with three valve sizes at the moment, 
And um, in a clinical study that was uh, just presented lately, there was a low rate of conduction abnormalities and a, and a low rate of power valvular leaks that might be the consequence of this unique design of the valve. Uh, the valve is deployed through a, a motorized system um, that enables a precise deployment of the valve and um, this is something we might uh, see with other uh, valve types in the future more often. And last but not least, uh, a few words uh, regarding the Medtronic. You're all familiar, I think, with the Evolute R platform. The Evolute Pro comes in addition, was introduced into the market with an additional skirt um, at the base of the frame, also in an attempt to seal off power valvular leaks much better. And um, um, the future developments that are um, expected is the Envio Pro with the seamless tracking the 34 millimeter valve that's supposed to come uh, next year, and the next gen Evolute with uh, superior ease of use, a better precision accuracy, and a lower profile, and uh, over the long term horizon with a, a transformative aortic uh, valve platform that is uh, shorter than the one that is uh, used currently. <coughs> As it had been already alluded by uh, Dr. Leon, um, we are expecting explosive growth in the Tavi worldwide. Um, we will have evolving recommended use guidelines with an expansion of indications. I think the decision is more often taken by heart teams, not only for, uh, with regard to aortic valve disease, but also with regard to other kind of structural heart diseases. There will be a carryover effect in the development of new subspecialties, and this had been already discussed. Acceptance of multimodality imaging, fusion imaging, I think, which is a key success not only in aortic interventions, but especially in mitral and tricuspid interventions, an exploration of uh, new clinical indications uh, with asymptomatic AS, uh, with uh, low flow AS, and things like this. Also, the patients will be better educated. There will be a better understanding of disease awareness, and this will um, in increase the access to TAVI. There are underserved populations, and you have nicely seen this uh, on the previous slides. There are accelerated innovations on the TAVI platforms. These were just a few that I, I could present to you. There are um, next generation valves that might be used in kids and that, that grow uh, once uh, the, the kids grow up. There will be a redefining of um, aortic stenosis uh, disease state and trigger points uh, beyond the Brownwald Ross concept. And I think there will be a realization of, of new clinical indications, not only for TAVO, but also for other structural valve intervention. Thank you. Yes. So we're going to keep going, and then we'll have some time for discussion. So our next speaker is a good friend, Dr. Von Bart Leyden. And um, he's going to discuss transcatheter mitral valve replacement and repair on new realities on the TMVR horizon. Thank you, Marty, very much, the uh, panel. Uh, I'd like to draw the attention now from the aortic valve, which is a proven technology and resembles now PCI in both senses of the world, uh, to TVMR repair and replacement. And you know this very old publication in The Lancet, 2006, where the undertreatment of the population has been described even in severe and symptomatic disease. And you, on the other hand, on the left upper side, you see the development in Western Europe and in Germany, uh, where you can see that the elderly population is doubling and tripling at the age over 65 years. And this has also been shown in the German Heart Foundation report. And you can see that the age group in mitral valve disease in Germany in the last 15 years tripled to 270%, uh, so it's not an extrapolation into the future, it's just the past, and this continues by about 20% per year in the next years. In five years' time, 60 to 70% more patients, and in China it will be 110%. So we have to differentiate the spectrum of mitral valve regurgitation, which is functional in etiology, in a majority of cases treated in Europe, uh, with LV dysfunction, LA dysfunction, both contributing uh, to a dilation of the annulus, or on the other hand, uh, valve disease, which is degenerative in nature and can be treated. 
Uh, the German volume as an early adopter of technology, both in TVR and also in mitral technologies, as you can see here, past surgical volumes in 2015, and is exceeding to growth in the older population with a mean age of about 77 years. Um, there is, of course, always the question of hope or hype, the obsession in medical advances and the high cost of false promises, but the promise is efficacy, as I will show you, and the goal is outcome. And for Francesco, I also put uh, the valve distribution of Mike Herman uh, into this to boldly go where no valve has gone before, and we'll see that in the talk. So what about mitral valve interventions versus our gold standard? Well, the experience procedural is high. TVMR has a very fast learning curve. Safety and repair is especially high with procedural mortality below 1% and other low procedural complications in other devices. But the TVMR replacement is advancing rather slowly with only about 350 to 400 implants worldwide. So heart surgery uh, still is the poster child in this regard um, in DMR patients. It's a gold standard, but only for DMR patients. And you see this already in the changes of this year's value of heart disease guidelines, where the concomitant surgery in patients going for bypass surgery has been taken out. And there's epivocal situations in those patients with injection fraction above 30%. And there's a predominance of percutaneous approaches in those patients with no low risk and injection fraction below 30%. There is coming data out, and uh, of course these indications still are 2B, so they're lagging far behind uh, surgical uh, or um, aortic programs, uh, but we have to see that also some changes are on the horizon. We know the classic MitraClip system with a uh, location of 52,000 procedures worldwide, and we have the new data on the STS-ACC um, US cohort as an analysis in the implant registry, but of course this has some flaws. Because of the FDA approval in 2013 in October in the US, only degenerative disease is allowed, so the conclusions drawn from these presentations and papers are a little bit limited on regard of FMR as only 8.5% of the patients are in FMR. The patients are very old because they should be inoperable. You see it's 82 years, much higher than Europe, and you see that there is a difference between death rate and hospitalizations, which is significant, so we have to treat those patients. There are limitations to the therapies, both in surgery and interventions, and there are negative predictors. One almost no negative predictor, as you can see, is age with a very minor impact, but dialysis, severe tricuspic regurgitation, or a procedural failure have been shown to be significant implicators for the outcome of the patient, so we should aim for a good result. The conclusions of the authors is that the acute effectiveness and safety in transcatheter mitral valve repair in the U.S. already is high. Uh, and that we have certain clinical variables that we have to see, which is age, ejection fraction, severe TR, that are predictors to the outcome of the patients. Concomitantly, even in 2013, 2014, we published the Europe, German guidelines on echo criteria on the repair techniques, which still hold true and which will be revisited at the end of this year. There are some new developments, like uh, the development of the MitraClip and T system. This is an analysis of 1,000 versus 2,000 patients. You can see that over time, also with experience with new devices, the procedural and device times can go down. And you see that the implant rate, which was in the STS registry only 92%, in the Everest trial only 77%, is above 97% uh, in the European uh, te uh, testing and registries. And this we published in the European Heart Journal last year, the one-year outcome of the largest worldwide registry in a prospective arm, which showed that the success rate in MitraClip, like in this analysis on the NT program, uh, increased from 77 to 97%, but also that surgical re-intervention dropped significantly from the Everest days in 2010 to now the uh, situation um, of 0.9 to 2 percent reoperation within one year. There is, of course, a bunch of devices in the repair market. You see the development of all CE mark devices in Europe, and you see that also a combination or toolbox, as also Francesco points this out, uh, is one of the possibilities. Imaging is a very important issue 
to align if on the transfer from the repair to the replacement uh, therapy to see all surgical uh, points like the trigones, like the annulus, like the commissures uh, in those patients. And one of this is hyperfusion, which has a huge impact on future models. Another impact is the toolbox approach of combo therapies, uh, like this combination in ischemic disease of an annual plus T together with a leaflet therapy, here with the cardioband, a direct annual plus T, here with an indirect annual plus T, uh, the Carillion system. And of course, you can use fusion techniques in order to guide your procedure easily, and those are 10 minute procedures to overcome a surgical failure in a 64 year old, now with a TVR in ring or TVR in valve um, to be done. There are other stakes that are difficult to treat for repair, and this is MAC calcification. We have no solution there in the repair market, so there have been early adoptions for TVR procedures. But now we also have native valves that can go into native annulus because the results in mortality and morbidity were poor. And as you can see in this editorial, this demonstrates an impressive progress over the last three years. And um, as a result of it, uh, last week also German Bee Farm, the German FDA, approved now a study uh, for a replacement program in Germany. The four most used valves in the US EFS trials have been the Cardiac Q Edwards uh, valve, the Tiara Neovesc valve, the 12 Intrapeat from Metonic, and the 109 from Abbott. The tendon valve is the valve that's most often used in humans. We're approaching 100 patient procedures. Uh, the data of this will be presented to the TCT in Denver next month. It shows an extremely low paravalvular rate and also an extremely low mortality at 30 days, as I'll show in the next slides. The beauty of a replacement approach is, of course, that any, if anatomically suitable, any etiology can be treated, as shown here with a diverse uh, prolapse of both leaflets and a severe MR, and you see the beautiful result at the right lower corner. And also in severe FMR, you can treat the patient with an excellent efficacy, so there is no residual um, MR, as you can see here on the lower uh, video that's playing a little bit slowly. This is the view and the control of the valve. It looks like a TVR valve. Imaging is far superior to aortic valve because the alignment is much better. The esophagus is in a much better position to the left atrium. And we nicely see, and Jonathan Leipzig is in the auditorium, that also CT have made major advances to control the tethering of the valve, the control, the neo-LVOT in those patients, and also see how the uncoupling of the inner stent frame of the valve is done versus the contraction, and this is important especially in degenerative disease, um, to the surrounding tissue of the annulus, which is a contracting, um, um, a contracting tissue between atrial and ventricular side. So the data on 30 days here with the first 30 patients is excellent. You see an all de cause death of only 3.3%. So this is one of the lowest in the replacement uh, field. And you see a high efficacy model with not less than two plus, but with less than one being zero, being the predominant result in more than 90% of all cases. And this is going along with consistent remodeling as you can see in this slide. So when we were coming from aortic stenosis with Axelinke, we passed tricuspic valve, which will also be discussed. The undertreatment in volume is even highest in the mitral field, as I may show you in this slide. So the take home messages are, there's an increasing growing aging population, 65 plus, that is at risk for mitral valve regurgitation predominantly in the US and in Europe with an increased rate of about 60 to 65% in the next five years. In China, 110% with a much larger population in one country. TVMR repair is safe. Procedural death rate is less than 1%. 30-day mortality is around 2%. Versatile and available already with 52,000 procedures. The toolbox and combo approach are looking for different devices for specific anatomies. TVM replacement is slowly advancing, but with a superior efficacy, but still some limitations in patient eligibility. And as with Marty Leon, I must say that modern 3D imaging and fusion 
is a must in TV MVR. And to conclude the heart team, we always have to quote a surgeon, and this is a quote in German TV from last week from Michael Borger from the Heart Center in Leipzig, and his saying was, the future of heart valve treatment is percutaneous, and this is a surgical and no interventional structural heart disease cardiologist quote. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, it's a great conclusion. Done by a great surgeon. Huh? Uh, you know him, uh, Marty. Eh? Yeah. Uh, why did you leave him uh, leaving uh, Colombia? So th that's another story. And now we'll have to move on to the forgotten valve. And the forgotten valve is a tricuspid valve. And uh, Dr. Horst Leiter is going to tell us where are we with transcatheter tricuspid valve intervention into a 17 unmet need, if there are any, and future perspective. I hope there are many. Alec, thank you very much, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, talk about this forgotten valve. And because it's forgotten, we don't have so many data. You, we are coming from the, the aortic, the TAVI procedure, with tons of studies, a lot of data. We've heard about the mitral approach, also a lot of studies um, and data out there. But now we're entering the dry cuspid field, and there are not many data actually out there. Yeah. You have seen this. There's a large number of patients um, who, are, who have some severe TR, um, but who are not currently treated with the, by surgery or by any other device. Um, I don't know if these numbers are correct, um, but what I can show you tell, and tell you from the German um, Tuami registry, you just heard about this, that about half of those patients we are treating currently with the mi for mitral clip for mitral regurgitation have moderate or severe TR. On, and we only look at those who have severe TR, it's one in seven patients which we are treated, treating with a mitral clip. The mortality in those patients is also severely decreased. There are a couple of studies out there. This is one of those graphs and figures always shown. And you see the more relevant the TR is, the more significant the TR is, the poorer is the um, outcome of the mortality rate increases significantly over the next few years. Now, what can we do? Of course, there is surgery. And, um, um, you already heard that the, surger, um, the, the surgical colleagues are not very fond of um, operating these patients. And this is due to the fact that the operative mortality is not that low. We're used to mortality rates 1 or 2 or 3% for aortic or mitral valve diseases in tricuspid diseases. And this is the data from the STS database, more than 50,000 patients, is significantly higher. We're talking about 8 to 10 to 12 percent mortality. And if you have a redo operation of, after a previous operation of the left heart, then it might even be um, significantly higher than that. And as I just told you, for the, in, in the, the, those patients we are treating with the mitral valve, with the mitral clip, they also have a lot of tricuspid disease. And this will also impact the outcome, the one-year outcome, but also already the early outcome. The in-hospital mortality, you see it down here, is significantly higher in those patients with severe TR that lasts to the 30 days and is, is really prominent at one year. So what can we really offer those patients with significant TR? There are a variety of catheter-based uh, approaches for uh, treating tricuspid regurgitations currently designed in early clinical trials. And we're talking today about the uh, mitral clip, which has not been developed for the tricuspid valve, but um, has been already adopted and techniques have been adopted to use the current system to treat patients with significant TR. And so there are a number of questions, and I would like to give you some of these uh, thoughts I have and, and what we have seen in our, early previous, in our early experience when we treated those patients. Now, can we, the first question is, can we really use the current system to steer the mitral clip to the tricuspid valve, which, as I said, has not been developed for the, for the tricuspid valve. And you see here in this uh, transthoracic image, yes, you can do this. You can get with the, tri with the mitral clip into the tricuspid plane. You, you can orientate the clip so that you have a leaflet on the left, a leaflet on the right, and by pulling back the system um, and closing the gripper arms, um, you will be able to grasp the leaflets. 
of major importance is that you're getting perpendicular into the right ventricle so that you have perpendicular to the right cuspid plane so that you, when you pull back, will be able to grasp both leaflets at the same time. Now, is it an is an edge to edge technique feasible and safe? Well, you're here and you are heard this a couple of times. Um, yes, we can grasp the leaflets and we can reduce TR. This is another patient which we treated here um, with a, from a um, apical for a jumper view. You see here the grasping of the leaflets. And when we're looking about the safety, these are the f one of the, f uh, the first 52 patients which we treated. The safety profile is very, very good as we are treating patients on, in the mitral space. No deaths, no, my no myocardial infarctions. We observed during the 30 follow-up one patient with a stroke, but this patient was also treated at the same time for, uh, for mitral disease, and probably the uh, thrombus developed in the left heart. Do we know where to place the clips? So far, most of us were very happy if we can go to the tricuspid valve, to find the tricuspid valve, to steer into it, and to place the clips somewhere. But shouldn't we be more careful and try to really place the clips at the, those places where we are most effective? And you know this figure, how the secondary TR, and this is, we're talking about secondary TR in about 90 to 95% of patients, um, how the TR evolves. We have an outward remodeling of the free right ventricular wall, and this is where the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet are attached to. And so what we think is at the current um, time is that it's probably very if effective if you're placing one clip into the anterior septal commissure in the center of the valve, and a second one very close to it in the posterior septal commissure, and by this we are pulling back um, the, um, the free right ventricular wall to the septum and reducing the uh, regurgitant or orifice very effectively. Is an edge-to-edge -edge technique then really efficacious in reducing TR? Um, and I'll show you here one of these patients, you see the TR before the treatment in the upper image, and then after the procedure, you see the TR is almost gone. And when we're looking at our data, about uh, here, 69 patients summarized, you see the significant TR before the procedure, TR three or four in almost all patients. And after the procedure, when we discharged the patients, um, more than 80% had a TR one or two. Now the m most important question is probably, are these data durable? Can we, um, are these uh, maintained over time or do we see detachments? Are the leaflets perhaps weaker or we see that the, leaf, the clips are tearing out? Um, well, I saw last week a patient which we treated one year before. And this was his TR one year and he was not able to walk five meters without dyspnea. This is the TR just last week. It's still gone and the patient is walking in a six minute walk test more than 300 meters with a significant improvement. And when we're looking at our six-month data, uh, just demonstrated before in, in the poster presentations, we do see that the TR is stable, and we still have 80% of patients who have a TR of two or less. And then finally, is there a clinical improvement? Well, we are treating a, a patients, who, and you will see this also in the next talk, with isolated TR, but also a significant proportion um, with um, com concomitant disease, concomitant treatment of the mitral and tricuspid valve at the same procedure. When looking at the, these 20 patients at, um, with a six-month follow-up, we still see that um, the um, New York Heart Association class 201 was prevalent in 60% of patients, a significant improvement in symptoms, but out of this, it's very hard to distinguish is it related really to the tricuspid intervention or perhaps to the combined procedure. And I'm t presenting you here for the first time uh, a very early analysis when we put our data together with the uh, Heart Center from Leipzig and looking here at the six-minute walk test and the NT Pro BNP, and the red um, dots are the combined procedures, mitral and tricuspid, and the green dots are just the isolated patients. And you see the very similar trend in the improvement in the six-minute walk test from baseline to one month to six months, 
um, in the six-minute walk test, but also a significant drop in the antiproprian P um, and in both groups. So what we do see, and this is our, what we, when, when I'm seeing our patients um, back after, after six months or now 12 months, they are really improved significantly. And I would f um, finalize my presentations. Of course, there are many more questions. I just want to summarize some of them. We really don't know which patients should be treated and when should we treat those patients. We should probably treat them not too, too late in their disease if the right ventricles are too large and uh, the patient is probably dying without any treatment or with treatment. Can, which tricuspid pathologies or pathologies for tricuspid reputation can really be treated with an edge-to-edge -edge, um, technique. There are some patients who have a very small cooptation gap, but then there's these huge central cooptation gaps, and can we really treat these with, with the current device or the future devices we have to see? There's an importance to really standardize the procedural steps and to get a standardized procedure as we have in the, for the mitral valve when we do the mitral clip. And we not only have to standardize the procedure, but importantly, the echocardiography and, of course, the screening. Should we treat MR and TR concomitantly at the same time? It's a large patient population, but should we do this at the same time? We can discuss this further on. And, of course, this device and the data I have shown you was obtained with an off-label um, use of the current device. But will a dedicated edge-to-edge -edge repair device, which is currently coming and being tested, further improve even TR treatment? We, we don't know. With that, I would thank you for, for your attention. Well, thanks so much for you know, giving some light on this very complex issue. So now uh, it's time for discussion. If you have any question, please come to the mic. There are a couple of mics. There are no seats, but there are mics. And while you are trying to reach the mic, I would like to ask to Francesco, because he's shaking on the chair, you know, for a minute or two. <laughs> uh, and he would like probably to comment a little bit on the transcatter mitral valve replacement and repair. How should we consider them? Enemies or friends, colleagues? So, first of all, you know, when, uh, this is a prepared question. You, you asked me before, can I ask you this question? I was preparing. I was, watching, I was watching in the audience. I would like to have the opinion. You know, there are so many innovators in the audience. And I'm sure that everybody has his own opinion. I mean, I wish I had uh, a little bit of uh, brain from uh, Marty, from Stefan. What, what is in our brain at the moment? So, first of all, <clears throat> I think nobody can really declare which one is uh, the leading solution. I only can say there are key features which will drive the decisions in the future. One will be safety profile. One will be the timing on the intervention. I'm pretty sure that we need both repair and replacement according to indication, patient selection, but most importantly, timing. Uh, if we can demonstrate that we can do early procedures, obviously repair will, will be leading. If we keep on treating patients end stage, replacement is going to be probably leading the, the field. So overall, uh, Alec, uh, I think uh, if I should answer with your brain, I would say, uh, you know, whatever decision uh, has to be taken in a hard team. Oh, that's uh, real. You know, he's a bright guy. Uh, may I ask Corrado? Corrado, you are bright also? I don't know if I'm bright. <laughs> Wait a minute. So if you don't know, hard team, my friend. Uh, and uh, so, Ralph, you already... Uh, that's all slighter. What is your uh, guess? Uh, of course we don't know, and we certainly need a lot of studies to answer these, these brilliant questions. But for, I would think that probably for, for younger patients, we always will shoot for a repair technique. Um, we know that biological valves are doing a great job, um, but they have their, um, their li lifetime is probably somewhere around 6 to 10, perhaps 12 years. So you probably don't want to treat these uh, younger patients with a repair technique, uh, with a replacement technique. I agree. 
You agree? Ah, now you... Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I was no, kidding. You, no. I was kidding. Yeah, so were. I think that uh, for younger patients, the repair is the best option at the moment. We have to wait a long-term follow-up for the so valve replacement. Dr. Sivansky, please. Oh, thank you. May I ask to, the ba to the, may I come to the basics? There is a major difference in the definition of functional MR across the ocean. So we've got the different definition in US guidelines and in the European guidelines in terms <coughs> of the volume and ERO size, which is the right definition in terms oh. of the severe MR. You're talking oh. about quantification. You are very yeah. Where bright, is Becky? Yeah. Becky, Becky. Becky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. Oh. It's a very interesting point, but I think we'll have several sessions on the uh, guidelines, but... Uh, Tomorrow. Maybe Marty, Tomorrow. Marty, Marty, you can defend the US but, uh, point of view. Well, I think the U.S. point of view emanated uh, in, a, in the small town of Rochester, Minnesota. Mm. Um, um, and I would argue that the most recent um, ACE guidelines from April really are, are beginning to bring this back into perspective. So I think that we're going to be very nicely aligned with our European definitions. Yeah, um, in Europe, we're, you know, very cautious because we kept the old ones, but if you read very carefully, we said we have to work in order to change, <laughs> most probably in the future, but let's have evidence and then change. But I think so, one, one point, if I, can, if I may, it's an interesting, surgeon, huh? it's an interesting yeah. question, but uh, I think uh, the answer to your question is in the definition of severe. Why we said that FMR severity uh, borderline, uh, border is 0.2 and not 0.4 is because it was a clinical evidence that that number is associated with events. So severity is defined, in my opinion, in this case by events, and it is a very good definition. No, that's very important. It's prognostic and not hydrodynamics. So, Marty, you want to make a very last comment on this uh, repair replacement story? Well, the only thing I'd say is that, that there's a controversial surgeon at University of Michigan, Steve Bowling, who <laughs> said something, and I, I listen to surgeons very carefully, maybe too carefully, mm -hmm. Francesco, but, but what he said was that a good repair is better than replacement, is better than a bad repair. Mm -hmm. And I, I like this. I, I think if you can achieve a very good repair, which is virtual elimination or near elimination of the MR without recurrence, that's a very powerful therapy. So if we can achieve that, that's going to be very important. But there'll be some patients where you can't achieve a good repair, so replacement will have a role too. So I think there'll be a role for both. Okay, so consensus, huh? So, so having said that, we move to the second part of the, of the program, which is going to be more, uh, let's say, problem-oriented. And it's my pleasure to invite my partner, Fabian Nitlisbach. Partner is always a bit difficult. Somebody yeah. say partner, oh, oh what? what Co-worker. <laughs> exactly. Co -work. like work partner. Col colleague. <laughs> it may include both. No, he's a huh? partner. He's a partner. He's a smart guy, too. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. He has a beard, you know, he's very good. <laughs> okay, I just to start with, I changed the title. I uh, changed it to uh, not going beyond the boundaries, but I think it's just going beyond the obvious because it's not beyond the boundaries what I'm going to show you. So this is the case I present to you. It's a 91-year-old hypertensive dyslipidemic female who presented in NYH class uh, 3 to 4 uh, in a nearby hospital and was transferred uh, to us for uh, therapy of this, as you can uh, see, uh, severe mitral regurgitation. She also had previously a, bi uh, a uh, bioprosthetic aortic valve uh, put in place, uh, and you can see that this valve also degenerated. So she suffered from severe uh, mitral regurgitation and severe uh, aortic stenosis with the degeneration of her uh, bioprosthetic valve. Although she was 91 years old, she was still living independently at home. She had a big house with a big garden. She had some comorbidities, as I told you. She was uh, previously operated uh, on the heart with a uh, surgical aortic valve and two bypasses. She also suffered from atrial fibrillation. That's why, that's why she's presented here, and she had very bad kidney function. She was admitted in acute uh, decompensated heart failure uh, and the two pathologies that you've been seeing before. Now, what uh, options do we have? We can say she is 91 years old. 
she, we should ch just opt for optical medical therapy. Probably she would never leave the hospital if you opt for this. You can treat the aortic uh, stenosis and see how the patient is doing afterwards. Leave the MR. You can treat the MR and leave the aortic stenosis, then she will also not even leave the OR. Or you can treat both. And of course, whatever you choose, there is something missing. Uh, because she has a hat, has blood score of three, she's at very high risk uh, for bleeding. And as you know, she was very active so far. So probably you could also opt uh, for left atrial appendage occlusion. What did we decide in uh, the heart team? We opted uh, for the treatment of aortic stenosis, then mitral valve uh, repair, followed by left atrial appendage closure. You can see the procedures here. This is a, uh, a core valve uh, put in. We split our valves basically evenly uh, in our center uh, between uh, portico, core valve, uh, sapien, and then we also have other valves that we use. So this was successful. This was followed by implantation of uh, uh, two mitra clips uh, with near elimination of uh, the mitra regurgitation and again uh, followed by uh, then, as I told you before, left atrial appendage uh, closure. Uh, the result here is also uh, perfect, and as you can see, this is not an amulet, this is an old ACP. The reason being because I'm gonna uh, show you two year uh, follow up of this patient. So this case was done more than two uh, years ago, and uh, that's why I think it's not beyond boundaries to have these combination therapies two years after uh, we already starting doing this uh, routinely. This is the final result, uh, and uh, you can debate what we did here. Does it make sense at all? You can say, well, these guys are really crazy. He's a 91-year-old. Well, I would ask back, is, is the age a criterion? Does left atrial appendage closure make sense at all? She didn't have a major bleeding so far, so why don't you just leave her uh, on Coumadin or an OAC? Does it make sense at all to do this in one single procedure? Uh, is this uh, safer or not? Uh, is patient comfort a criterion at all? Or would you just make your 91-year-old patient come back three times to your hospital? Well, here is the follow-up that I can uh, show you. And I picked this case because, of course, it was a successful one. Uh, she developed spontaneous eye bleeding on day two. Still, she recovered and was discharged at uh, day six. We have the last uh, follow-up, as I said, it's two and a half years after uh, the uh, original procedure. Uh, she lives still independently at home, takes care of her garden, is in NYHA class one to two, didn't have any bleeding events so far, and with now 93 years, the only medication she is taking is aspirin and the statin, and I think that's pretty good. So here is some data that would support what we have been doing in this patient. Uh, we put together, or actually Shingo, our fellow, put together uh, uh, consecutive cases uh, where we combined left atrial appendage closure with uh, the mitra clip procedure and compared these 25 to just 25 consecutive patients in AFib where we just did uh, mitra clip. And as you can see, with all major outcomes here, the outcomes were at least uh, comparable if you combine the procedure or if uh, you don't uh, uh, do left atrial appendage closure. So what we conclude from this uh, preliminary study is that it is at least safe to combine it. And the same is true actually for combining uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement and left atrial appendage occlusion, something that we published in Jack Interventions uh, last year, you can see there is actually no difference in a composite safety uh, endpoint if you do isolated uh, TAVR or if you do concomitant left atrial appendage closure. Of course, this is not uh, good enough, the data that I'm showing you. This is why we started this trial, uh, a randomized trial on, on TAVI plus LAA closure or TAVI alone, and we're currently uh, recruiting. And there is a similar uh, but bigger trial uh, currently going on in the United States, and we're very much looking forward to the results of these trials. So with this, I thank you uh, very much with some impressions from our beautiful city.
Any question? Any question in the audience about this, uh, let's say, provocative case? Not yet, not yet. So you think, oh, oh, one question, and then we move to the next uh, one. Uh, maybe you did uh, three uh, big procedures, so mm -hmm. you may have two great holes in the septa wall, <laughs> and is it okay with, him, with her? Yeah, so that's uh, actually a very good uh, question. Always after uh, termination of the procedures, of the combination <coughs> procedures, we check uh, whether there is bidirectional shunt. Mainly, of course, we don't want to have right to left shunt. And if that's not the case, we just leave the hole open and uh, it will close in the vast majority of patients. However, if we see bidirectional shunt, we would, sure. of course, put in uh, uh, an ASD occluder. Okay, thank you. So, you know, we struggle in the U.S. with doing the combined procedures because we can't get reimbursed if we do them at the same setting. Um, I, in fact, I went to Washington to meet with CMS to discuss this, and it's, it's, it's uh, a bit of a problem. That, um, so, it's, so unfortunately, to do some of these combined procedures, we have to stage, even though it may not be in the patient's best interest. The devices are so expensive, unless we get reimbursed, it's problematic. But don't worry, I think it is the case in most countries in Europe, too. Also in, also in Switzerland, but we had took a decision to, for the comfort of the patients to lose money for, uh, and, uh, and to do more, uh, more in, in the interest of the patients. I hope that would be reimbursement. I think Germany is a bit always uh, It's, it's not so much different. So uh, combined valve procedures are partially reimbursed. So there's a rebate for the insurance companies, but the LAA included wouldn't have been reimbursed also in Germany, not. You, you can agree to lose money when you have money, but if you don't have money, <laughs> <laughs> please go ahead. Well, you know, I tell you, I have uh, I just received now the invitation of the financial department to discuss <laughs> this topic. So probably we will not do these cases next year, Fabian. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, can you call him? Yeah. So uh, we proceed with the other case example from New York uh, again on uh, bivalvular disease. Uh, it's a case of mitral and tricuspid. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I already talked about this a little bit. And now the, really the question is then finally, who should be treated uh, at this and how and when? Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna do, show you this patient. It's a 70 year old uh, male patient, very symptomatic. He has a dilative cardiomyopathy with an ejection fraction of around 20%. The echo shows you the severe TR and the severe MR um, in this patient, here, and, and he has significant tricuspid annular dilatation. He already received a device, um, a CRT device, 2009, and has some other comorbidities. Of course, we treated the mitral regurgitation first, and you see here the 3D um, color double volumes before the procedure and after the procedure, and I think it's clear that there's almost no mitral regurgitation left after the procedure. But now looking to the tricuspid regurgitation, you see here the two um, echocardiographies, um, TE images of the severe TR, and if you look at the lower, the, the transgastic views, you do see here the um, septum, there's the lead and the posterior septal commissure. This is the septal leaflet. Here's the anterior leaflet, and here's the posterior leaflet. And you see that, as we do see in most of these patients, that there is a central chat that extends into this anterior septal commissure. And this was also displayed here while the movie was uh, still running. Now we place the first clip up there in the anterior septal commissure, very close uh, to the aorta, which you see here. There's already um, a reduction of TR, um, and here, after placing two clips, it doesn't run anymore, I'm sorry about this. Um, the TR was significantly reduced during the procedure. This is how it looks like during the procedure. Two clips on the mitral side to the right, and the other two clips on the left side in the tricuspid valve. We're doing some hemodynamics, as I, said, as I told you before. You see here the um, right atrial pressures, the, R, the V wave in the right atrial pressures. So this is around 20. So we had an, around 28 to 30 millimeters of mercury V wave, which was significantly reduced after the placing the two tricuspid clips to around 22 millimeters of mercury as the V wave and uh, the mean values significantly lower as well. 
You have seen this before, the image is before the procedure, and at discharge, the TR in the transthoracic echocardiography was um, almost gone. We're seeing these patients in one month, six months, and 12 months follow up, and then even beyond this. And you have seen this um, a similar image like this before, a good result in the mitral, for the mitral valve, but also here for the tricuspid valve, a significant reduction compared to this torrent TR, which you have seen before the procedure. There's still some TR uh, jet left, which is originating, and this is what I'm showing here, just at the site where the, um, the uh, ICD lead is going through the tricuspid valve, but overall a significant reduction. And this translated also into a significant improvement. Um, he was before the procedure in NIHA class uh, three to four, and at one month already at two, and this maintained at two. You'll see the six minute walk test significantly increased at 30 days and maintained at this high level, and the pro P level significantly dropped. Now, who should really be treated in the combined procedure for mitral and tricuspid uh, regurgitation? Certainly, um, symptomatic patients, very, we are treating very selected patients with very good echocardiographic views. If you don't see the, the tricuspid leaflets, then probably this is not a wise procedure to do a concomitant procedure. All of those patients should have severe TR, of course, and signs of right heart failure. Now how the edge-to-edge -edge repair technique of both valves is feasible, this is what I have shown you. Um, it, uh, but we have to respect the anatomy of the uh, tricuspid regurgitation. Um, the cooptation defects shouldn't be too large, and we need to have some very, very good um, imaging. Echocardiography is really essential in this. Other percutaneous techniques, of course, may also work. I don't, we don't have a lot of experience there. Then when is the biggest question? Um, there are some arguments for a staged procedure. We know that in approximately 50% of those patients who are treated with mitral clip and who have at the same time severe TR, there, there might be an improve or there is an improvement in TR over time. There, it's coming down a little bit, so maybe it's worth waiting a little bit. Another important point would be to wait because the procedures might be long if you combine those, especially in unexperienced hands. Um, in our experience now, we are having about an, uh, adding about uh, um, 60 minutes, about an hour for treating the tricuspid valve when we're doing concomitant procedures. Then there are others, other um, reasons for doing it at the same time, of course. We are very, have very sick patients, frail patients, and avoiding a double general anesthesia, avoiding double um, TE um, studies might be very helpful for those frail patients. The clinical improvement may be better also in those patients if we treat them early um, at the same time. And we don't know that yet, but um, I have shown you before that there is also an increased mortality after mitral clip uh, implantation in those patients who have a, have a mitral, have, the, um, have a severe TR, but it, so maybe there's a chance that we can also reduce this early in hospital mortality if you improve, um, if you treat both valves. And finally, there are reimbursement issues. You can argue with this also for perhaps for a stage procedure, but there might be also in some countries the benefit if you do it in the same procedure. Thank you very much. That was excellent. I, I have one question. If you talk to the surgeons, and this was popularized by Gilles Dreyfus and others, most of the tricuspid repairs, surgical repairs, are not done in patients with right heart failure. They're not even done in patients with symptomatic disease of the, the, that you could say is referable to the tricuspid valve. They're done at the time of mitral valve surgery yes. when the tricuspid annulus achieves a certain dimension. Well, the, the, this, do, do you think we will ever progress to the point, does it make sense, that we will follow suit at some point in the future, that we make a similar decision in, in managing tricuspid regurgitation and not waiting till patients have more extreme disease with severe symptoms? I, I d really don't uh, know, but um, we are listening to at so many other points to the surgeons and trying to transfer their experience to the interventional field. So I think that probably at some point when we have established um, tricuspid interventional therapies, we might treat patients earlier and um, um, 
and this will also be then the fact for those patients who have some significant MR, um, but perhaps only a moderate TR because they do at the end may uh, have a better outcome over time. May I ask something? Yes, please. I have a comment and a question. The comment is, uh, is a 20% ejection fraction with a dilate, dilated uh, biventricular disease. So it's a patient with a very, very poor follow-up. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if it's a, a futile intervention uh, to treat both valves. Second, after the clip in tricuspid valve, the pressure in the left atrium dropped down from 40 to 20. This is still high. Well, I'm... I'm it's still high, but, but um, and, and we are usually not able to really abolish TR, we have to say that. We can reduce the regurgitant regur volume significantly, but there will still be some jets probably left. That might be also beneficial for the right heart because we don't want to increase the afterload too much. If it's going to be futile for those patients to, to be treated, I don't know. We, we, are lo we looked at patients um, with really severely depressed ejection fraction below 25%. Mm -hmm. And of course, treated with the mitroclip. Some of these um, die very rapidly, but a significant proportion, about 50%, live for four or five years. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we are saying the surgeon do, surgeon will do, etc. <coughs> but we have a surgeon. Put your hat, surgical hat. We have a surgeon, so Francesco, what do you think about this, uh, so this approach, this proposal? So combination of therapies in surgery is a, is a trend which has been uh, very clear in the last years because of the evidence that not treating tricuspid uh, annual dilatation may induce uh, over time uh, uh, new occurrence of new TR. And obviously, as a surgeon, you want to open the box only once. You, know, you open the chest once and you want to do one only procedure. We have a different approach. We can do it in a stage approach, and this is probably more, uh, re the rationale is higher, but there is a problem. The problem now becomes the timing. I mean, the reason why I'm saying but is that the timing is very clear. Most of these patients will develop TR, will be treated with medications because it, the, the time for intervention is too early and they will be kept on medications until the timing will be too late. So the real problem is that most of the patients we get in surgery are late patients which have no alternative. And the same happens now with all these procedures. We're treating most of these patients who are end-stage, biventricular, heart failure. Like uh, Corrado said, maybe we are really making some futile interventions. So again, once more, key is timing here. Yeah, but if I may add to the confusion, uh, I think that f as regard repairing on a systematic basis, patient when you operate on the mitral, only because the annulus is enlarged, is largely based on very old studies. And there is a, there is a debate, tried. and now there is a randomized trial, which is an ongoing CTS and trial, in patients who have no severe TR, but only annular dilatation, and we'll see. Probably it deserves more, um, more data. You want to comment, Stefan? I saw you shaking your hand. Uh, I, no, I, I think we, we have to remember that there are differences between percutaneous interventions and surgery. So, so I think all this rationale comes from rethorocotomy, and we've seen that those isolated patients for worse because if you go a second time into the, into the body, uh, this diverse and defers a far worse outcome. This is not the case in percutaneous interventions. So all patients that we've treated, I think also Jörg, your patients uh, in the last 14 months, they're all alive. All tricuspid interventions percutaneous are alive. And this is, this is a complete difference. And we know from TVR that there is a 40% chance of improvement. So I'm, I'm opting more for a stage procedure. You can wait three months, you can look if there's a chan, change. If you have a primary disease that will not change, but a functional disease may change. So you, you devote and you, 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 you deflect actually a procedure that may not be totally necessary <coughs> from 40% of the patients because you solve the problems. The TR is not always the main problem. It's uh, following another problem, left heart problem. That would be my, my comment. But may I ask you, both of you, you are part of TRAMI. And in yeah. TRAMI, if I'm correct, 
you showed that having severe TR is a predictor of one year mortality, but also 30 days. Am I correct? And also in hospital mortality. Yeah. In uh, hospital. So correct. isn't it an argument in favor That's of uh, doing the tricuspid uh, quite early on? That is correct. Perhaps I have to be more precise. So, so, so I think torrential or very severe TR, the situation may be different. I'm, I'm talking more of moderate, uh, moderate to severe, uh, because also only this really improves in the patients, also in aortic stenosis. So, so I would, I would. Um, I would also opt for, for simultaneous or concomitant procedures in the more torrential or severe patients. And there is a mortality difference. You don't see that between mild and moderate, by the way. Yeah. Okay. So maybe we'll move on. Yes, we're going to move on to our final speak. Well, not final speak. No, 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 final, final in this session. Final. Excuse me. Semi-final. Yeah. Pentultimate. <laughs> yes. So Corrado Tamburino is going to talk about another version of bivalvular disease, yeah. Yeah. AS and MR. Before, uh, I was thinking to the guidelines, so we, uh, I think that we have to say something. Um, I think that we are biased, because most of us are interventionalists. Yeah, but we are brains. Uh, also uh, clinicians, but uh, uh, we do interventions in the cat lab, but we don't follow the patient, or we don't prepare the patient. We, dis we see the patient in the cat lab, and looking at the I'm interventionalist, and so I approve and I eager to perform combined procedures as well as interventions. But looking at the guidelines, I read you something that I uh, uh, took just a few minutes ago. So questions, essential questions in the evaluation of patients for valvular interventions. First, how severe is the valvular heart disease? Second, what is the etiology? Third, does the patient have symptoms are symptoms related to valvular disease? Are, are any signs present in asymptomatic patients that indicate a worse outcome if the intervention is delayed? What are the patient's life expectancy and expected quality of life? Do the expected benefits of interventions versus spontaneous outcome over outweigh its risk? What is the optimal treatment modality? Are local resources, et cetera, et cetera, what are the patient's wishes? So I think that we are, as you said today during your uh, superb lecture, you. that we are in the fog uh, for sometimes because uh, some, some think because we treat the patients because we think to do the best for the patient, but so far we don't have that enough for treating all the patients that we treat. Said that, I treat the patient. So I show you. <laughs> yeah, uh, we have to, to say. Uh, uh, Thank you. I show you uh, a case where uh, during the same hospitalization, we performed a, a procedure, a stage procedure, a TAV before, and then a mitral clip in a patient that was still symptomatic with hypertension, pulmonary hypertension. So the, a little bit of background, because uh, we should know, I should remember, uh, bear in mind the, uh, the MR is often present in uh, patients with other valvular disease, and in patients with severe aortic stenosis, uh, is, uh, the concomitant disease of mitral valve is uh, often present, 5 to 20 percent according to different statistics. And we know that uh, a moderate um, MR may increase uh, uh, the mortality of the patient. And we have data showing that the outcome of the patient with MR after TAV is worse than the patient without MR. And uh, we know also that if we send the patient to the surgeon, the mortality uh, during the interventions increases a lot. And there is, a, a, I would say, an unacceptable mortality when compared with percutaneous therapy. And uh, uh, then we know also that there are several mechanisms of mitral regurgitation that could uh, improve, but in some cases uh, worsens. Uh, first, uh, we can have a, a, a deep implantation of uh, a mitral prosthesis into the ventricle, so impinging and uh, limiting the movement of the mitral, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. We can have uh, a aortic regurgitation with, uh, with the LV dilatation, so worsening of a functional MR. We can have a pacemaker syndrome, and it's, you see when you pace the patient that the blood pressure falls down 
sound because there is MR in some cases, and we can have a sum uh, due to in hypertrophic ventricles to excess of contractility and uh, systolic anterior movement of the anterior lifter of the mater valve. In this uh, study, you see the source XT uh, data showing the mortality in patients with MR, and this is studied by Marco Barbanti, my co-worker, not my partner, uh, but that uh, <laughs> shows the same and shows that uh, there is, a, there is a, a, a different outcome in patients with both valve disease and then treated uh, according to TAV treatment, percutaneous treatment, and surgical treatment. So uh, we know that in contrast with surgery, percutaneous approach does increase the mortality and the outcome is good. I think that the only limitation for most of the center is an economic burden of these two procedures uh, linked. And when we have a two disease, uh, mitral and aortic disease, first should be treated and has to be treated the aortic stenosis. Among the 15 patients that we treated uh, with the combined procedure, and only in one case we performed a clip in a patient with a moderate aortic stenosis, but in the same setting we were obliged to perform the TAV because the patient uh, LV uh, didn't tolerate the uh, overload of uh, the aortic stenosis once the mitral was fixed. So this is a patient of 71 year old, uh, was a female, is a female, uh, hypertensive, obese patient. In uh, Sicily we have m often uh, uh, very uh, small ladies uh, and very large ladies. So uh, BMI is uh, uh, often uh, 35, 38, 40. And surgeon also in absence yes. of, of other comorbidities send the patient for TAVI uh, because of the single uh, risk factor uh, represented by obesity. But in this case, we have a patient uh, which is uh, in near class four and has uh, a cardiac uh, heart failure, uh, 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 hepatopathy, and the score is intermediate risk and ST is, is a low risk patient. So the ejection fraction of the patient is 30%. The patient has a low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis and a, a severe mitral regurgence. So we, uh, with the Carmelo Grass Sgroi, we started uh, performing uh, uh, and deciding with the uh, heart team uh, uh, to implant first a portico valve in the aortic uh, <laughs> valve and then uh, moving for a mitral uh, electively in the same uh, hospitalization. This is the uh, imaging of the patient and, uh, uh, oh sorry, and uh, the area is 4.7, the perimeter is 8, so according with this size, we have a 29 portico valve uh, suitable for this patient, no coronary artery disease, uh, and uh, this is the procedure. Uh, where you see the orthography, the balloon valvuloplasty. I don't know how they merged all these uh, different steps in a single clip. And this is the valve implantation. The position of the valve is high, it's perfect. Perfect sealing of the patient. No paravalvular leak, no AR, despite the, the, the wire is inside. And, uh, so the patient was transferred to coronary intensive care, and uh, after that we changed and optimized the therapy according to the uh, single valve disease at that point, and there was a, a, a good performance of the valve, and the, there was a still a persisting systolic pulmonary pressure, which was 45 millimeters of mercury. So after 10 days, we decided to move for a clip implantation, and Carmelo Grass and Marilena Di Salvo implanted the valve, the clip, and after mm -hmm. the first clip was implanted, there was still MR and, uh, with two jets uh, lasting, and so, uh, the operators decided to proceed on with a sing, uh, second grasping in a lateral position. And so this is the image of fluoroscopy after the second grasping, and there is a still a single jet uh, persisting. So at the end, the patients had a third clip that you see here with um, no MR, but only a trivial jet. Um, with three orifice uh, valve, mitral valve that you can see here with the three holes. And here you see that the, uh, 
there is a very low gradient, five millimeters of mercury, and uh, mild MR uh, lasting, and the systolic pulmonary pressure fall down from 45 to 35 millimeters of mercury. And the patient moved from four to three uh, near class at the beginning of the procedure, uh, before the TAVI, to near class uh, two, and was discharged in excellent condition. Mm. So my conclusion are that MR is a frequent uh, associated, associated uh, in patients undergoing TAVR. Uh, the rule for us is to wait and see, because in most, of, most of the patients tolerate well the uh, residual MR, and in 50% of the case, there is a reduction of MR. And, uh, and we don't know the impact, although there are data showing that there is a increased mortality. I think that this is valid for younger patients than for older patients. And uh, uh, the mechanism of MR are different. I showed the four cases. But we know that the MR can be safely fixed by mitraclip and other percutaneous therapy without no increase, uh, with no increase in mortality. And I think that uh, uh, all of us agree that the TAV should be performed as first procedure. And as I said before, uh, there is an increased mortality in surgery when uh, two valves are treated simultaneously, and there is no increased mortality when we uh, deal and fix the uh, two valve disease with a percutaneous approach. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, Corrado. Uh, may I ask to Stefan and uh, Dr. Osleiter to comment a little bit, because I think, Stefan, you have quite a large series of these sort of patients. Uh, on the uh, the combinations with yeah. um, uh, so, so the combinations uh, in aortic and mitral we we actually do quite the same so we've done uh, between 1,500 and 2,000 TVRs we have I think two simultaneous procedures with mitral repair at the same time mm -hmm. um, on the other valves I see this a little differently so so I think the the association is rather at 5%. Well, the association between when what Jörg showed uh, between mitral and tricuspic regurgitation mm -hmm. is much more frequently uh, seen. And I think there the combination will also be more often be indicated. What would you think, Jörg? Um, I certainly agree with that. Um, and coming back to the aortic um, stenosis and mitral regurgitation, I think there's a, I think we have to also respect the um, mitral pathology. If the patient has a secondary MR, then it is also very likely that, that the MR is going to improve over time because the, the pressure load to the left ventricle is going to be decreasing with the, uh, with the cure of the aortic stenosis. It's going to be different in patients with the primary MR. There, probably, you can um, you cannot expect that the MR is going to improve significantly um, while waiting after treating the patient with the TAVR. Okay. So uh, those patients, I would uh, see probably much more earlier and be more more hap more liberal to place um, a mitral clip in those patients. So if no. There is no question. I think you heard a consensus here. You heard a cons is it the same in your side, Martin? Yeah, it's the same. In the, in the first part in the trial, even though we excluded um, severe MR, when the echo lab looked at it, 20% of the patients had, had moderate or severe MR. But there's such a difference in terms of the effect of, of, of TAVR if it's functional or degenerative. So, so if it's degenerative and severe, um, you may have to do something. Okay, so the present is settled. Now let's glimpse into the future. Francesco? Yeah, so the uh, future is always uh, very difficult to predict. Uh, let's say, <clears throat> you know, I will start with the present again. And to make a statement, you know, uh, we started with pulmonic, we went into TAVI, we done the mitral, we done tricuspid, Sorry guys, done deal, we've done everything. So no more first cement stuff, it's done. What is the future now? Well, <clears throat> there is a lot of evidence that these technologies are really uh, standard practice. And you know, if you look at TAVI, after all this evidence, it is uh, strongly represented into the guidelines. And uh, it's already set the stage to become the primary uh, a methodology to treat patients with aortic stenosis. So I think uh, this is something which was in the, probably in some uh, 
futuristic presentation from Marty Leon many years ago, but not, I'm not sure everybody would imagine this would become so fast. The other field is the mitral. If you remember the very early predictions of the investors and, and the analysts, uh, mitral should be much faster than Tavi. This was not the case, but it's coming. Also, the mitral uh, area is evolving, not only in terms of numerical experience, but also in terms of uh, the var variety of uh, technologies. Once more, there is uh, one device which is uh, set in the stage at the moment, and maybe for many other years, which is MitroClip. MitroClip, uh, you know, there is uh, Professor Alfieri, I've seen it before. Don't uh, underestimate the value of what it brought to this community, because I think uh, without the Alfieri technique, I probably we will not talk about mitral intervention so easily. And mitral interventions now are evolving in terms of uh, uh, physician experience, we can tackle patients that we, this was a patient that I think in the first edition of the German guidelines was considered a contraindication, a type C or whatever, a red, a red color. And uh, we can treat these patients today. We learn how to deal with complex anatomies and we, we go beyond boundaries uh, quite easily, at least from a technical standpoint. Replacement, it's a reality, it's happening. Uh, since many years, I would say, not only uh, in an edit bar, but also in uh, other situations, uh, it is happening. Tricuspid, booming. Combination therapies, happening. So, what's next? Well, I take the example of mitral valve therapies because uh, I think uh, for Tavi, we, we really beyond. Eh? Uh, I think we are now turning the curve, uh, crossing the corner of feasibility. I mean, I think we, we've been able to show that it is feasible. We can improve, but it is uh, somehow feasible. It's time to make a larger adoption. And not all the institutions have an active uh, program. You know, when we talk about combination therapies, for instance, Tavi and Mitral, there are some institutions where this cannot be done in the same setting because two different operators are expert in doing the two procedures, for instance. We need to build the evidence because we need to change practice also in this field with a very integrated approach, which is much more complicated than Tavi because Tavi is a mechanical intervention which is very straightforward, is an afterload uh, solution here is a combination of therapies which have to be integrated in a much wider spectrum of other therapies where mitral interventions are competing against drug therapies and heart failure treatments. One thing for sure, timing is key. If you open a parachute at 100 meters, you die. So if we keep treating these patients with these legs, I mean, okay, we do things, we, are, we, do, we show feasibility. We're learning how to do it, we're learning imaging, we're learning the nomenclature, we're changing the guidelines saying we now have torrential TR, but still, the patient will die. And so, this is where I think the future should bring us. We should impact the future by working not anymore only on feasibility, and again, to me, this is a great opportunity to impact cardiovascular medicine at its fundamental uh, uh, basis, which is impacting on the physiopathology of heart failure. So this is a very common, very famous uh, uh, diagram that shows the, uh, uh, the common natural history of heart failure patients, that they get more and more symptomatic. In the early stage, these patients are usually treated with optimal uh, uh, medical therapy or guideline-oriented medical therapy. Usually, when this doesn't work, CRT comes into the discussion, and today, somehow, we say, okay, when nothing happens, let's think about the mitral. This is basically the co-op trial approach. When nothing else happens, when nothing else functions, when the patient is almost not responding to nothing, let's try something which probably will not also be so beneficial. We have to move to an integrated approach where we use unloading uh, 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 therapies together. All these therapies are unloaded the ventricle. There is no one single therapy 
which is uh, really acting on the ventricle. We're only acting on the load. So the ex unexplored fields of this, uh, of this uh, structure interventions is obviously we have to expand the limits of feasibility. We still can do more with more imaging, more training, with more combination. We can improve durability. This is also potentially with learning curve, with better technology, again with combining therapies. We can improve prognosis by going earlier, combining therapies, working on biocomparability. We can improve efficiency, developing the heart in 2.0. We can discuss a bit about this later. Define the role of surgeons in the team. Do we need surgeons? Yeah. <laughs> so, and again, this is a, a sponsored uh, uh, session, and I, I don't want to make a, 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 a talk about Abbott overall, but it's a, it's a trend. So Abbott and St. Jude joined. This is a fusion, this is a combination. This is a integration. So there is a trend to integrate resources. So Abbott and St. Jude Medica joined and now they covered the full spectrum of therapies, instruction, interventions with all potential targets that you can imagine. Starting for, for, as a surgeon, uh, St. Jude has been for many years a very reliable partner. The St. Jude Medical Valve is, uh, the me mechanical valve is standard practice. A lot of new stuff happening in this company. So all this is happening, imagine. And now we have a lot of tools and somebody has to tell us which one we should use. We don't know yet. We want to play with them all. We are all kids, we remain kids. We want to understand how to do it. And obviously we have to focus and, and to uh, expand our efforts in uh, generating the evidence. This is, uh, again, what uh, is in mind. We, we, these are the trials which are undergoing, supported and sponsored by Abbott. Because the vision is the toolbox. Toolbox for a tailored approach. We know that uh, at the moment we have a very preliminary toolbox. We need to improve this toolbox. But the real problem, again, in my opinion, is that we have to evolve as a community. The heart team 2.0, we talk too much about the heart team. But is the heart team functioning everywhere? Are you happy with your colleagues? Do you like the surgeons? If I ask the surgeon, do you like your cardiologist? I mean, probably most of us are not still so happy. And I think in all this uh, uh, situation, in all this uh, constellation, there is one risk if we don't really include, we not become more inclusive, there is a risk of the value of death of knowledge gaps. What that means? Well, it means that uh, in the heart team, there, you know, the heart team started uh, many years ago, but I think the first uh, discussion in this arena was for Tavi, and it started because there was lack of knowledge. You know, I was a surgeon, I didn't understand about wires, the, the cardiology didn't understand about the sternotomy because sometimes it was very important to do sternotomy. <laughs> but it was a necessity to cover lack of knowledge. After 10 years, you know, I, when I see Antonio Colombo describing the, the, the difference between the genetic and functional MR, it's amazing. 10 years ago, nobody, you know, when I ask Antonio, Antonio, can you give a lecture about the mitral? He will say the mitral valve is uh, a, a structure which is surrounded by the circumflex artery. <laughs> <laughs> so, is right, by the way. <laughs> now, what is happening, really, we need to revolution. The next revolution is not going to be technological. The next revolution is going to be intellectual. We have to go in a different direction. Really, we have to leave the concept of the hard team. We need to build the new leaders. And now, you know, uh, as Marty has been uh, uh, making advertisement for TCT, I advertise something which we do in, uh, in Zurich. We structure a new course for the leadership in, heart, in, in the hard team. You know, we know the hard team, but who is leading the hard team? What, is the, the, what are the uh, competence for the hard team leader? Clinical competence, we, I mean, a leader in a team cannot be stupid. 
and should be also somebody who understands. You know, if somebody leading me and say he does is not uh, able to do a TAVI procedure, I say, no, sorry, you go around. I'm doing. I'm the leader. So it has to be clinical and technical competent. Has to understand what the others do. What is the role of the others in the team? Has to be a good partner for innovation for the uh, for the industry because in the hard team we evolve, we develop, and obviously has to be a leader. Now, how to do this? I don't know. We try, we're trying to start now in a, in a small group of uh, young raising stars which are coming to Zurich once a year to make this happening is a new certification for uh, leadership in aortic structure interventions. This is happening with the help of many of, uh, around this table because we really believe in the future. In the future will be like this. We will diagnose structural heart disease earlier, and then we will find a way to show that early treatment impact prognosis. We will be able to do cadre-based interventions like surgery, and we can do surgical procedures in those patients who unfortunately cannot get the cadre procedures, which will use device inspired by the cascaded therapies. That is already happening. And I think and I hope that by that time we will have enough scientific evidence to support indication timing and choice of treatment. Thank you. Co made a fantastic conclusion. Everything was on the slide. Intellectual, good hands, good heart team, and good devices. Thank you. <laughs> Very good.